Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This is the third video in the series on testing coax. In the first video, I discussed the physical inspection of the coax and its connectors. I also suggested a method of testing to see if direct buried coax is still intact. In the second video, I presented the DC testing of feed line making sure there are no shorts or opens where there shouldn't be, and no semi-connections. But just because a feed line passes these tests does not mean that it's good to go. Working well at DC is not a guarantee that it'll work well with RF energy. In this video, I will be presenting four different tests to perform at RF. The first is the SWR test. This is what I consider kind of the minimum RF testing. The second is distance to fault. Is my coax degraded on the inside? The third test is coax loss. Is my coax lossy? This might reveal poorly manufactured coax. And the fourth is at power. Does my coax break down when using real transmitter power? If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Now, let's dive into the process. Let's talk about the first of the RF tests, the SWR test. To do this, we need an antenna analyzer or a VNA, maybe a nano VNA, mini VNA, tiny, whatever some way of accurately measuring the SWR. We also need some kind of a load, whether it be a small termination type load or a dummy load, some kind of a 50 ohm load that we can stick at the end of our test coax. Now we tend to think of uh, our dummy loads or terminations as perfect 50 ohm loads and that somehow they have a one-to-one -one SWR across their entire operating range, and that is absolutely not the fact. For that reason, if we're going to do this test, we have to know what the SWR of our load is at the two different frequencies that we're going to be measuring. So we take our load, and the first step is to directly connect it to our antenna analyzer and measure its SWR as carefully as possible at one megahertz and at 100 megahertz. Make a note of these two SWR readings and you say, why are we doing it two different frequencies? And, and the reason for that is that if there is a capacitive connection in your test coax, the SWR will be terrible at the low frequency and good at the higher frequency. So by doing it two different frequencies, you can determine if there's inductive or capacitive issues going on in your coax. Once you have these uh, SWRs of your load, you now put your test coax in between your antenna analyzer or VNA and your load and you now measure the SWR of your load again at these two different frequencies. Now, the, the, freak, the SWR should be pretty much the same, although in reality, it might actually be a little bit better at 100 megahertz than what you measured earlier, and, you, and you're going, well, why would it be better? Well, that is because the loss in the coax actually makes the SWR of the load look a little bit better the higher the frequency you go. Now is that a good thing? No, because you're getting less power to your load. So high loss in, in your coax will cause the SWR to look a lot better at the higher frequencies. So expect it to be maybe a little bit better at 100 megahertz than what you measured when this was up close and personal. So when you're doing this though, what you want to do is while you're measuring the SWR, 
Again, like before with the DC tests, you want to put some mechanical stress on this connector to see if that SWR is going to vary. Now, it may vary a little bit just because you're touching things, but it shouldn't vary a whole lot. So that is the SWR test. We're going to perform the SWR test. The first part of the SWR test is to find out what the SWR of our dummy load is, is at two different frequencies, 1 megahertz and 100 megahertz. And I am zooming in here. Here we are. So at 100 megahertz, about 1.3 to 1. Now let's go down to 1 megahertz. Oh, this antenna analyzer doesn't go down that far, but we can go down as far as we can go. It goes down to 1.8 megahertz, so let's do it at 1.8. And it says 1 to 1 at 1 1.8. I've connected the coax to the antenna analyzer and I've connected the other end of the coax to the load and we can see here we have a 1 to 1 SWR according to this number here. This one down here is indicating 1.1 to 1 which is what the VNA indicated. So let's go up to 100 megahertz and see what it looks like up there. 116, 104, 103 and we see 1.2 to 1 on this indication right here. This looks more like closer to 1.3 to 1 there. We expected some improvement because of the loss in the coax and of course now you want to stress the connection on the coax itself. Make sure that that changing position of the coax isn't going to cause the SWR to change and it looks nice and stable. Having calibrated my VNA at the connector I directly connected the load to my VNA and I'm measuring the SWR at 1.8 megahertz because that's what I did with the uh, MFJ antenna analyzer. If we want to look at this, it's 1.1 to 1 at 1.8 megahertz. We go back down here to 1 megahertz, it's still 1.1 to 1. Now we'll measure the SWR of this at 100 megahertz. Having recalibrated between 95 and 105 megahertz, we are measuring the SWR at 100 megahertz at 1.25 to 1. So we will mark those values down and then insert our coax between the VNA and the load. And now I have inserted the coax between the load and the VNA. This is at 100 megahertz. Notice that the SWR actually improved. And I said that that would actually happen because of the effects of the loss in the coax. It was 1.25 to 1. And now we're seeing 1.19 to 1. And as I flex the, the connector here, you're noticing that it is not varying at all. It's not moving at all. And that tells me that the connection at the end of the coax is what it ought to be. Let's move down to the 1 megahertz and see how that looks. We have now moved down to 1 megahertz. And here we see we're at 1.1 to 1. This is 1.06 to 1. So our coax passes. And here let me stress my connectors here a little bit.
and nothing. Look at that, huh? So the second of the tests that we're, the RF test we're going to do is distance to fault. The purpose of this is to indirectly determine whether the velocity factor of your coax is what it ought to be, which would indicate whether the dielectric coefficient of the internal insulation uh, is what it should be according to your data sheet. So to do this, follow the instructions of your antenna analyzer. Your fault that you're going to be measuring to is an open end of your coax, so you just leave this completely open, connect the other end to your antenna analyzer, and then you follow the instructions for your antenna analyzer for distance to fault. Having done so, uh, you should end up with a physical length of your coax, which is approximately the same length as the actual coax that you have. If you're using a vector network analyzer instead, what you're going to be doing is setting up your VNA to measure phase and you're going to calibrate that uh, VNA right to the end where you're connecting your, your test coax to. You're going to measure phase and what you're looking for are the places where the phase goes from minus 180 degrees to plus 180 degrees. You're looking for the lowest possible frequency where that transition occurs and that's the frequency that you're interested in. Once you have this frequency, to calculate the length in feet, you take 245.893, you multiply it by the velocity factor that's in your data sheet, and then you divide it by this frequency that you determined here, and you come up with the length of your coax in feet, and that should be approximately the same length as your coax. We're only really looking at uh, catastrophic faults. There's going to be some variation back and forth, so don't be terribly upset if it's you know six inches one way or the other. Just is it pretty close to what it should be? In this test, we're going to do distance to fault. The other end of our piece of test coax is unterminated. There's nothing connected. It's not touching anything. And there's two ways that the MFJ antenna analyzer can be used for distance to fault. To begin with, set your frequency all the way down as low as it'll go. And watch your X number, this meter here and you slowly increase your frequency and you'll notice as I go up the X number is going down it's going down it's going down and eventually it hits a zero note this frequency continue going up going up going up going up eventually it will pop back up to a one note that frequency Average those two values. Divide 492 by that average value that you just got and multiply the result by the velocity factor of the coax being measured. And the result should be the length of your coax in feet. The second way is to use the advanced options in the antenna analyzer. We start again at the lowest possible frequency. We hold both of these down. Notice it says advanced. We hit mode, mode, distance to fault and feet. And now we are going to do the same thing. We're, we're looking for this value to drop to zero. So there's three, there's two, there's one and we go a little bit past. What we're trying to do is hit just about in the center between the two places here. And then we hit the gate. Notice it now blinks second. We're going to continue up in frequency and we continue up until we get to a second place where the X value equals zero. 
and you'll notice this is going up and it's, so it's real easy to watch just watch that let's uh, we got to go all the way back down again and we watch our little meter we can see this is coming down as well and we go along until we hit the second spot where that comes to zero there is zero a little bit past it goes back to one so it kind of hit right in the middle hit gate and now it's saying distance to fault is 115.7 times the velocity factor so we're going to take 115.7 feet and we're going to multiply it in the case of this coax by 0.66 and that tells us it is 76.362 feet long now I know because I've taken out my measuring tape that this is 78 feet 4 inches long we're pretty close now let's do the same thing with the vector network analyzer I've calibrated my VNA for the frequency that I expect to be looking at here and you notice I am in phase so this is degrees. Now watch what happens when I connect up my adapter so I can connect my coax. You notice that the phase has changed here. So we need to apply a port extension so that the phase out here comes to zero so that's what we're going to do and for the sake of our measurement that is perfectly good at this point now let's connect our coax so I've connected my coax changed my scale per division so I can see this transition from minus 180 to plus 180 I have my marker here. I'm going to drag my marker over to this frequency. And you notice you can't make that stick in the middle. So I'm going to add a second marker here. That way I can be really as precise as possible. So I have two markers. Uh, they're not very far apart. So now I, I can look here and I see it's 2.04 is this marker, 2.05 megahertz is that marker. So 2.045 is probably this frequency right in the middle. 2.045 megahertz. And that is the frequency that we are going to use to find distance to fault. Doing the math gives us a physical length of 79.36 feet. Now I know my coax is 78 feet 4 inches or 78.3333333 feet long. And if I just look at the difference between what I just measured and the actual physical length as measured with my tape measure, there's only about a 1.3% difference. So from a velocity factor standpoint, I think that this coax is doing just fine. The third test that you will be doing with RF tests is the loss per 100 feet. An important note here, you're going to be going to the data sheet for the coax. Now they will give you numbers at specific frequencies for the coax. So the test that you do has to be done at one of those frequencies that they spell out in their data sheet. One of the most common frequencies is going to be 100 megahertz. Although sometimes they say, well, 400 megahertz or one gigahertz. You know, our test equipment, generally, it doesn't go up that high. So you have to try to find a data sheet that has a frequency that you can use. At any rate, uh, follow the directions for your antenna analyzer. 
it's going to be an unterminated end down here. So how does the antenna analyzer do this? Well, what it does is it sends a signal out. And because this is a perfectly horrible load, it means that it's unterminated and 100% of the power that gets to this point gets reflected back here. If this was a perfect piece of coax and this sent out 100 milliwatts, it would see 100 milliwatts being reflected back at it. But it doesn't because this coax has loss. It has loss in this direction and it has loss in this direction. So, what the antenna analyzer is going to do is it's going to say, well, I know I got loss in both directions, so I am just going to report the half of the loss that I see. But it's reporting the loss in the length of coax that you have. It's not reporting it in loss per 100 feet. And in order to compare that to the data sheet, you need loss per 100 feet. To get that, you take 100, that's 100 feet, times the loss that your antenna analyzer is reporting. Divide all of that by the actual length in feet of your coax, and you will get loss per 100 feet. Don't be surprised if it's a little bit off one way or another. That's just fine. But you're looking for catastrophic problems, not, not little nuance problems. Now, if you're using a VNA instead, the process is a little bit different. You're calibrating your VNA right to the connector where you're connecting your coax to. You're setting it so that it shows dB magnitude. And with nothing connected to this port on your VNA, you should see just about 0 dB of return loss. So you're looking for what's called return loss. Some VNAs will call it S11. And you want to display dB magnitude. With nothing connected to the port, you should see pretty close to 0 dB return loss. Now you connect up your cable. It is sending power out. It is getting reflected back by the end of the cable and coming back. But the VNA is going to be showing you the, the complete loss the loss going out and the loss coming back. It doesn't divide it by two. So you have to divide it by two. That's why our equation changes here. You look at the specific frequency that the data sheet says is it's rated at for its loss per 100 feet on the VNA. You take that number, you multiply it by 50. Notice that that's half because we only want to see half the loss. 50 times the loss that you read off your, your, your VNA, and then divide it by the length of your coax and feet to get the loss per 100 feet. And again, you know, it's going to be, there's tolerances there, so don't get too upset if, if the data sheet says 1.9 and you got 2.1. Okay, so there's tolerances there and coax ages, but 2.1 still isn't all that terrible. You're looking for big changes that's going to make a difference in how things operate. Measuring coax loss with the MFJ antenna analyzer is very simple. We just hit the mode switch until it says coax loss. We select the frequency in question. We want 100 megahertz. So we have 100 megahertz. It's telling us that our coax loss is 1.4 dB. But now we have to put this 1.4 dB into our equation 
and see what that comes out to be. So 100 times 1.4 divided by 78.33333, because that's how long my coax is, comes out to be 1.79 dB. We have calibrated the VNA and added a port extension. With nothing connected, we can see we have almost 0 0.05 dB. Now let's connect our coax. The frequency of interest is 100 megahertz. At 100 megahertz, our VNA reports minus 3.41 dB. So our loss in dB is equal to 3.4 2, if we kind of average that out, 3.42 dB. We remember that that is the loss of the signal going all the way out to the end and coming all the way back. Now we can put this number into our equation and calculate the actual loss at 100 megahertz per 100 feet. Having done the math, that comes out to 2.18 dB per 100 feet. The data sheet says 1.9. So that's not too bad. I mean, this is really, really old coax, and we're not that far off. It isn't glaringly different from the data sheet. The last RF test that we're going to talk about is what I call the at power test. It's a pretty simple test. All you're doing is connecting your transmitter to one end of the coax through let's say an SWR bridge of some flavor. You're connecting a dummy load, preferably a dummy load at the other end of your coax. And then you are applying RF power, maybe 100 watts, maybe 50 watts down that coax. And whilst you do, if possible, if you can flex connections between the connector and the coax, we do that a lot in these tests because that's the Achilles heel of a feed line is where the terminations are. And you're watching the SWR and you're making sure that the SWR is stable even at power because all the tests we've done so far have been at low voltage and low current and low signal levels. And those are all well and good and they could behave very well. But then you start applying real power to it and things heat up and things change and then all of a sudden they start being naughty. So that's why this is kind of a good test. It's the very final test after you're sure everything else looks good. It's, it's the one where, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. But if you can get through this one and you've done all the rest, then you have 100% confidence that your coax is 100% good. If you don't have a dummy load that can take your power well, you could connect it to an antenna, but don't forget to identify yourself while you're doing this and listen before you transmit. We don't want you transmitting on top of people. That's just bad form. So with that, we've completed all of the tests of our coax. Through this video series, I have completed a thorough testing of a piece of feed line from the physical through the DC testing and ending in the RF test. You might not have to do every test I've presented in this series to have perfect confidence in your feed line, but if you perform them all and the feed line passes them all, then you have perfect confidence that your feed line is reliable. You may have noticed that I talked a lot about the connectors and how they're installed on the ends of the coax. And this is because that is often the most probable issue. Now, if you found this video and this series helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Until next time, thank you so much for watching. Toodaloots.